Well, in a way, this is a paper about a couple of ideas uh, that have sort of been lying around in my head for a couple of years without me being really conscious about them until I think Emir asked me this autumn whether I could say anything about the socio-economic consequences and equity principles of, well, transport policy or maybe congestion pricing, which happens to be one of my favorite topics, or something else for that matter. Um, and, and, then it's, and, and, and along that time, I had sort of been toying around with, with this, with my sort of, that I didn't really feel very well when I talked about equity effects of congestion pricing. Because as you probably all know, as soon as you start to talk about congestion pricing, then someone will say, uh, but it's unfair. And they mean so different things with this unfair. Uh, and the, thing is, the same thing is true when you say things like, uh, well, m maybe we should raise the, the, uh, 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 the price of parking, for example. Well, that's not fair either. Okay, fair to who? Fair to, and, 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 and for that matter, what is fair? I mean, is it fair if the poor people pay more or pay less or pay relative to their income? Or is it fairness in terms of principles? Uh, and that's sort of the, the backdrop of this particular paper where I sort of collect my thoughts about at least the different views uh, or my impression of the different ways that people use the concept of fairness when they talk about whether a specific transport policy is fair or not. So there are at least two views then of fairness. Uh, something can be fair uh, judged from the viewpoint of which people win or lose from a specific transport policy. Another view of fairness is whether it's in principle fair, whether the mechanism or whether the underlying principle or motivation or something is fair. Uh, sometimes these things are called consumer and citizen perspectives. And consumer then is, well, your objective things that you get, uh, travel time, travel costs, maybe something else. Whereas the citizen perspective, that's something else. That's, that's when you put yourself in a position uh, as, and being asked whether something is fair in a general sense, without thinking about how you personally is affected. Sometimes these things are called homo economicus versus homo politicus. Sometimes there's a distinction called personal well-being or subjective social welfare, which is something else. And different authors have then used different terminologies for this. But as I said, cons the consumer's perspective, then, as I will use this, will include things like travel costs and travel times, how revenues are used, maybe, and, and, and if this policy had been something else, it could have been something like you know, the comfort of the trip, all of these things which typically will go into uh, what an economist would call, would call a utility function. And this is essentially traditional equity analysis, which groups win or lose from one particular, point, one particular policy. policy. Whereas the citizen perspective, it's, it's about principles and procedures and allocation mechanisms. Uh, it's about asking the question whether the, the underlying principle or the underlying rationality or motivation of a particular reform is quote-unquote fair or just. Now, the problem from a methodological point of view is that you can't really ask people this because they will subconsciously or as a conscious bias answer something else. So if you go to a car driver asking whether congestion pricing is fair from a citizen point of view, he, or, or well, mostly he, sometimes she, uh, will, will probably ask, answer something else. They will, they will answer something which is tainted by their own self-interest. So trying to figure out what people really think about something, abstracting from their own self-interest, is actually, from a methodological point of view, not an easy, easy thing to do. Why then is this important? Well, it might be important from a, so, from a sort of social equity point of view if it is the case that a, some, so, something like congestion pricing is an elite project. I mean, and, and this has struck me over time over time because you know, probably like many of you, I spend most of my time with other economists and transport analysts and transport policy people. And most of us, they, we think that, you know, using pricing mechanisms to allocate something is a fair way to do things. We sort of, we are trained that way and we are self-selected that way. And we think that, um, for example, allocating things by a lottery is just deplorable. I mean, we, we, we just don't like it from an emotion point of view. And we also think that it's not effective, it's not efficient, it's, not just, it's just not fair. But 
if it is the case, if it is the case that these views about what's fair or what's just happen to correlate with education or income or being in power, uh, then we have a, sort of a problem from a democratic point of view. Uh, and and, and that, that's also sort of the backdrop about my interest in whether this uh, citizen uh, perspective on fairness uh, correlates with income or not. Okay. So to do this, uh, I've used data collected by me and a couple of uh, research friends uh, from Stockholm and Gothenburg and Helsinki and Lyon. We asked uh, uh, in, in a rather big survey about both about travel patterns and also about attitudes, about all kinds of things. Uh, and it's good to know that Stockholm has had congestion pricing in place since 2006. Uh, Gothenburg introduced congestion pricing in 2013. So in this particular material, there is Gothenburg before congestion pricing and also Gothenburg after congestion pricing. And there's a, well, it's a really interesting difference when you introduce congestion pricing, what happens to people's attitudes. But that's really another story. Helsinki, at the time of the survey, proposed a zone-based distance—a distance-based zonal system, which was then never introduced. Uh, Lyon uh, didn't have any discussion about uh, congestion pricing at the time, so they used a, a, a hypothetical area scheme. But these things are not really so important for the for the conclusions that we'll make anyway. First, then, consumer perspective, and as I said, this is basically a, a traditional equity analysis. Who, which groups win or lose the most? Well, basically, rich people will pay more. because First, because they drive more, uh, they, they own more cars and they also use them more. Uh, and they also drive more uh, in urban areas where, where most congestion price, pricing system will, will charge drivers more. Uh, it's probably easier to look at the right picture here where I've normalized uh, with the average payment per city. And then you can see that, oh, let's see here. Um, yes. That you can see that uh, the poorest group, they pay the least. And then people pay more and more as the richer they get. Up until the highest income groups, where at least in two cities, the, uh, the, share, the, the, the amount of money people pay, they, it actually drops. Especially in Gothenburg. And that has to do with the... Uh, well, the... Uh, um, uh, not really uh, deliberate uh, decision by the tax authorities to exempt company cars from paying congestion prices. And that had to do with the interaction between the company car um, uh, taxation system uh, and what defines a tax in Sweden and the fact that it just had it sort of just turned out that way that a congestion charge in Sweden from a legal point of view is actually a national tax, not really a charge. And this then interacted with the tax legislation in a really in, in, in a complicated way, which ended up with company cars being exempt, which no one really wanted, but it was just the way the lawyers, well, interpreted things, basically. Uh, well, so, but basically, uh, rich people pay more. On the other hand, the poor people, they pay a larger share of their income. Uh, and again, it's probably easy to look at the right picture here, where I normalized with the average percentage per city. And then you can see again then that the poor people, they pay roughly, well, around 1 to 1.5% 1 of their income. And then it drops, especially in Gothenburg then. Uh, you can see that in Stockholm, uh, which is the black line here, the regressivity of this tax is smaller than when you compare it for the, in, to Lyon and Gothenburg, for example. Okay. So the rich then, they pay more, but they, on the other hand, they pay a larger share of their income. Is this okay? Uh, is this problematic? Well, when you, when you talk about taxation, then you will typically define a tax as regressive if the poor people pay a larger share of their income. So if the purpose of the congestion charges is to raise revenues to do something which you would otherwise have paid for by public money, like building metro systems or building roads or subsidizing public transport, something, something like that, then my own view would definitely be that this is, this is absolutely problematic. Because what, this, what you're doing here is essentially doing something, you, you, you're, you're essentially uh, going around uh, circumventing the, the, um, the, pub, the, 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 the usual income taxation system to do something else. So what you're doing, if you're using congestion pricing essentially to fund something, then you are introducing something which would be regressive in most circumstances, at least for these four cities, and 
I would be really surprised if, if it's not the case in most cities uh, otherwise. Because, I mean, these four cities have... It, it, it's it's, it's, it's uh, um, uh, the difference between um, the poor and the rich in terms of travel patterns is relatively small compared to, for example, developing countries and also compared to U.S. or, or, or uh, 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 North American travel patterns, for example. On the other hand, if the purpose is really and solely to make economists happy and just correct prices, uh, sort of make prices for driving more to reflect better the actual social cost, the full social cost of actually driving a car, then there's something else. Because as a general rule, prices are usually the same for everyone, both for efficiency reasons and also to avoid paternalism. Because uh, in one of the papers, I think in one of the South American papers, some, someone introduced the, the, uh, the problems of errors of inclusion and errors of exclusion, which was a really nice terminology, which I will now... Uh, will uh, decide to, to, to start using myself as well. So, so what you're doing is, if you, if you subsidize something, essentially, you're essentially saying that it's better if the poor people spend their money on transportation than spending their money on something else, which you also need. I mean, food or clothing or housing or nicer vacations or maybe you know sending their kids to a better school or something like that which is not something that you really would like to do unless you think that the poor can't decide for themselves and as coming from you know a liberal kind of country i personally think that unless there is compelling evidence for the case that the poor can't decide for themselves how to spend their money then we should try to avoid being paternalistic and just try to, you know, hand over money to them into, through welfare transfers or um, progressive taxation, and they, them, they themselves can then decide whether to spend their money on food, housing, clothing, education, or something else. So targeted subsidies towards transportation just to make the poor poor uh, better off just for that kind of is, is well, it, it has the problem, problem of, pater of paternalism. So, but on the other hand, uh, um, correcting prices is something else. So if it's, if it's really the case that you want to just correct pricing to make it better reflect uh, the full social, social cost of, uh, of, 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 of transportation, then I personally won't really have a lot of problems with the poor people paying more. Because what we're really doing is that you're just correcting the prices, which is something else. Uh, on the other hand, I'm, so far this only have, 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 have had to do with the actual uh, monetary cost of pricing. If we then broaden this con sort of consumer measure about uh, or the, this consumer um, measure of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of, co of congestion pricing to also include things like the value of time, the number of the car trips, the number of cars in the households, which are all reflected sort of in, uh, in, in the long term. It has to do with, with how people will be affected by congestion pricing. We can sort of uh, make something which I decided to call the compound self-interest, which is a term I just invented because I needed it. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and sort of and, and include more things. Uh, now, to construct the relative weights on these things, then, I estimated a model of how all these variables affected people's or the respondents' attitude to, attitude to congestion pricing. And when you do this, you, uh, well, there are a couple, couple, couple of mathematical things which I won't go through, but I'll just say that we had this referendum question where we asked about things like how would you vote in a referendum on congestion pricing for this particular system? Um, and then we can, could then estimate, as I say we, because, well, it, it was actually I, but I had, <laughs> I had help anyway. Um, uh, I estimated this ordered logic model where I regressed the answer uh, of how people would vote in, the, in this referendum on the number of self-interest variables, and then this measure, this y variable, would then measure this compound self-interest, uh, which is a latent variable. And the estimation results are well, what you would expect: the more people pay in tolls, the less happy they, the, the less positive they get to referent to congestion pricing. Uh, the more car trips they do, the less positive they are. The higher value of time they have, the, the more positive they are. Uh, people are more positive in cities which have congestion pricing, which is Stockholm and Gothenburg afterwards. They are less positive in, in, in cities which don't have congestion pricing, which is Helsinki and Lyon. Uh, 
And if they don't have a car, they also are. So if they don't have a car, they are more positive, which which is what what you would expect, of course. If you then do the same exercise, you get what you would expect. And this this figure essentially shows the same thing, almost anyway, uh, as the one that showed just the monetary effects. So you, you see that the poor groups they are better off compared to the richer groups, whereas the richest groups, uh, the the fifth per, the fifth. Um, uh, quintile, they are actually slightly better off than the fourth quintile in all of the cities, except for Lyon, for some reason, where all of the groups, except for um, the poorest quintile, they get better and better off the richer they get, which I think has to do with the, the, this hypothetical Lyon scheme. It wasn't really well constructed, apologies to my French co-authors, but, but they really didn't put a lot of effort in, in you know, designing the system really, really efficiently. Uh, so anyway, so uh, that didn't, didn't really change much of the conclusions. Turning then to citizen perspective, the the backdrop, as I, I already said this, but, but I'll, I'll just repeat this anyway. Uh, the opinions about what is fair or just, that may vary across socioeconomic groups. Because, I, I mean, my, my sort of prejudice about this would be that people in high-income groups and people with higher education would think that things like pricing, for example, would be more acceptable, would, would be viewed as fair or more just or would sort of be more social desirable compared to lower income groups, for example. Is this true? Well, the concept of congestion pricing first, it sort of, a, it, it, it combines many things. I mean, it's first, it, obviously, it, it's about allocating a scarce resource according to willingness to pay. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is that it's, it's actually a little bit like taxes, because what you're doing is that you transfer resources from the individuals to the government, which means that if you trust the government, if you think that you know, handing over resources to a public government and then just trusting not just politicians, but, that, but trusting the government as a whole, you know, a, a conglomerate of politicians and legislation and civil servants like myself nowadays, um, uh, and, and then trusting them to spend this money in, in a wise way. If you think that this is a good idea, then you will tend to be more positive to congestion, to, to congestion pricing. It also has a different, a certain flavor of environmental effects because you will just you know, reduce car traffic as a whole. And if you think that all these three, these three things are good, then you will, on average, be more positive to congestion pricing as well. Uh, these are then a number of, these are 10 questions out of, I think we asked something like 20 or 25 questions about how, which, which attitudes people had to, both um, towards uh, things like environment, their trust in government, uh, their, their, about, their opinions about equity. Um, we had a rather nice uh, thought experiment about, about a ferry which, where, where uh, a certain bridge closed down for repair and then we had a ferry and then the ferry got full and then people had to, to choose whether, um, uh, whether to price the ferry to, to meet de demand equal supply or uh, allocate space to this ferry through a lottery or let the government decide about the, this ferry or, um, or, 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 or have it allocated by a queue instead. We also asked about pricing in general, airplane tickets or transit fares and things like that. Uh, there are some interesting uh, differences, differences across the city. For example, this ferry question was, um, uh, to, to, um, generally speaking, uh, the French population, they didn't like this idea at all. 25% uh, of, the, of the French population, they, they thought that all of the allocation mechanisms were unfair. So pricing was unfair. Uh, and government allocation was fair, and unqueuing un allocation was unfair, and lottery was unfair. And we couldn't really come up with any more alloc allocation mechanisms than this. So, so sort of it, it, it begs the question here, what, what the 25% of the population of, of the French respondents, uh, what, what, what they really want us to do. Uh, they just think life is unfair. They, they were negative about price. Uh, they were... Yes, on average, but 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 actually, forty percent of them graded that as as, as unfair to not. To, I mean, because what you could think when you see these questions that that these that the persons who dislike pricing they would like governmental allocation instead. 
but that was not the case. So there were 25% of the respondents who graded all of the different allocation mechanisms as all of them either very unfair or horrendously unfair. Uh, so, yeah, I, I suppose so. I mean, being a politician in France can't be easy, uh, which, which we sort of already knew, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so, what I would have thought was that, that there would be a strong correlation with income, that, you know, high-income people would grade, uh, um, uh, for example, pricing as more fair, for example, but it turned out that the correlation with income was, in almost all cases, was really, it was really low correlation. I mean, some of them went in the direction that you would expect, but most of them were really small, with the exception of question number two, namely, the government should prioritize to reduce the differences between the rich and the poor. Essentially, take more people, take more money from the rich and give it to the poor. The poor people thought that this was a really good idea, uh, whereas the rich idea, which the rich people thought that, no, maybe not a really good idea, except for new, where even the rich people thought, yeah, well, why not? <laughs> Take our money. Uh, which, or or, or on the other way, or, uh, in the other way around. Not even the poor people thought that this was a good idea compared to the rich, which was a sort of surprising result. Uh, but apart from that, for example, uh, question number three, taxes in my country are too high. This was something where there wasn't really a big difference between the poor and the rich. It was not the case that the poor thought that the taxes were too high more than the rich. Oh, that was a too, too complicated question. Uh, I mean, too, too complicated sentence. I thought that the rich would agree more to the statement the taxes are too high than the poor thought, but it was not the case. The, the rich and the poor, they, they agreed in the sense that they agreed with the statement in exactly the same extent, if you get my point. Yeah. Hopefully you did. Uh, so let's then estimate a model of the correlation between this attitude to congestion pricing and the attitudes to allocation mechanism and the pricing and taxation and environment and, uh, and environment and so on, and then crucially, controlling for self-interest. So what we'll get here is the correlation between what people think about pricing and what they think about congestion pricing, and what people think about environment and what they think about congestion pricing. And all the time we control for self-interest, we control for how much people pay in tolls, how many car trips they do, uh, they make, and uh, etc. And then we can just pick out this latent variable, which we can then sort of, with a slight abuse of, of, of terms here, call the citizen utility. This is only the part of utility which relates to these other social issues and then measure, in a sense, how well aligned congestion pricing is with the respondents' socio-political or quote-unquote citizen attitudes. And I, I will read this again. The citizen utility that measures how well aligned congestion pricing is with the respondents' socio-political attitudes. Can I ask you a clarification? Yes. Especially if you pre press, press the, the red button. button. That'll align us. Okay, so you you ask these questions generally of a sample of citizens, and in effect to calibrate an expected set of answers, and then try to elicit a response within the specific context or score it within the context of congestion pricing using your compound self-interest uh, estimate. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So, uh, and, 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 and just to just to sort of borrow your your excellent explanation of <laughs> what I'm doing here is that if you think about that, there are a number of you know vectors in space where you have environment, and then you have taxation, and then you have trust in government, and then you have whether you like pricing as an allocation mechanism, and, and, and maybe a couple of other vectors as well. And then congestion pricing is like a linear combination of these vectors. So we don't ask people directly, how do you like congestion pricing? Because that would be in, uh, um, uh, uh, that, that would always, always be tainted by their own self-interest. But instead, we measure the correlation between these vectors in space, environment and taxation and trust in government and so on, with how they align with congestion pricing. And then since we have asked about whether, how, what people feel about taxation, environment and so on, and so on we can sort of measure how well aligned their general political orientation is with respect to congestion pricing and call that their citizen utility with respect to congestion pricing. That's the idea here. 
Yes. Yep. Did you use an hybrid model or just you a Latin class model? I mean, you put together economic and uh, attitudinal together or not? Yeah. Is we uh, we estimate an ordered logic model where we control both for all the self-interest variables, the value of time and the, the the toll payments and everything, and then we throw in. Uh, what we actually do is that we use uh, um, uh, ordered f factors from a factor analysis where we group together things like trust in government and environmental concerns and so on. Uh, so, so, so what I show here is actually uh, clusters of factors, uh, which we, for, for simplicity I'll, I'll call something like environmental concerns, for example, but, but they are actually proxied by a number of uh, different questions, uh, all relating to, to environment, for example. Let's see. Uh, so the citizen, uh, the, the estimation results then. Well, uh, the, blow, the bold ones here are the ones that are new. So if people are environmentally concerned, uh, or if they think the pricing is fair, or if they think that uh, letting the governmental agency decide what the ferry, that's a fair thing to do, and if they think that equity is a priority. Uh, and all of these are positively correlated, except for equity, which is not correlated at all being with, with, um, with uh, congestion pricing. So there is no correlation uh, between thinking that equity is important and being either opposed or against, uh, I mean, <laughs> being opposed or in favor of congestion pricing. I mean, there is no correlation. But if you think the taxes are too high, if you don't like taxes, then you are also against congestion pricing. I need to sum up here. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, the blue bars, you've seen this before, that's the consumer utility. Whereas the red bars, these are the citizen utility. So if the red bar is high, then as a citizen, you are sort of inclined to think that congestion pricing as a principle, as a mechanism, is something that you tend to like. And you see that in all uh, cities, except for Helsinki, it's the, actually the middle income uh, who are most in favor, whereas the, the, the richest people because they, they, most, uh, they are actually the, 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 the persons who are least environmentally concerned. Um, and the, the, also the lowest income people, because they are the ones who are also the least environmentally concerned. And they're also the, most, the people most unhappy with the taxation system. Uh, which is kind of strange, because I mean, you, 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 might, you might think that the richest people would, would be the ones who are most unhappy with taxation, but they are not. It's, it's actually the, 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 uh, the poorest people who think that the taxes, taxes are too high right now. If you split this into uh, components, then you, well, this is, it's a little bit hard to see here, but if I tell you that it's a, that it's a case, then you can just trust me, perhaps, that, that what happens is that uh, that the, uh, is actually the middle income group that they are most, both most environmentally concerned and they are also the ones that are most happy with the current levels of taxation. So, summing up then. There is basically no support from this research anyway that congestion would be unfair from a citizen perspective. I mean, what I feared when I started this, that it, that it would be the highest income group who would think that congestion pricing is sort of a nice principle. Uh, it's actually the, 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 uh, the middle income group who are the most uh, happy with the principle of congestion pricing. Um, it's also evident that, that the perceived purpose of congestion pricing, that really affects attitudes. I mean, is it, a, is it perceived by the public as a tax or as an environment, environmental measure or as an allocation mechanism or something else? That would really affect how people support or oppose congestion pricing. The first part where I did this traditional equity analysis, well, it's essentially saying that rich, pay, rich people pay more than the poor, but on the other hand, they pay a lower share of their income. And as I, at least I argued earlier then, I would say that this is sort of okay if congestion pricing is solely a price correction, but if it's, if it's sort of a fiscal measure, it's a way of generating, uh, generating, uh, generating revenues, then I find this problematic because then it's really about uh, having a regressive tax source. That's conclude things. Thanks.